So now we will be moving to our fair housing and racial justice panel. Uh, we will be talking about fair housing as a tool to achieve racial justice. And I think that this conversation is especially important within the context of the past year, where we've seen countless black men and women be murdered by police, as well as countless crimes against uh, Asians based on discrimination and racism. It is this same discrimination that caused those injustices and it also bleeds into our housing ecosystem through housing discrimination. So we have an amazing panel of experts with a wealth of experience on the issue of fair housing, and they have experience on both the federal and local levels. Uh, so joining us today, we have David Harris, who is the managing director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute of Race and Justice at Harvard. We have Tracy McCracken, who is the director of fair housing at the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, also known as NCRC. Dwayne Tyndall, who is the executive director for the Alternatives for Community and Environment, also known as ACE. And uh, to kind of get us started, so as you've heard here today, uh, HUD took many steps to reinstate AFFH and the disparate impact rule. But we can't stop there. There's a lot of work that we need to be done to make sure that we can use fair housing to achieve racial justice. Uh, so to kick us off, David, I know we've had many conversations about the need to expand the way that we use fair housing. Can you help us to frame some of the current issues around fair housing for racial justice and what else needs to be done? Sure, I'll try. Uh, I'd like to share my screen and I, I want to thank you, Ryan, and thank Chapra for this uh, fair housing celebration. It's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. So uh, let me try to share my screen. I'm gonna do this in the, in the interest of time, I hope. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so, uh, so again, I wanna thank you. And uh, I have to say when Ryan first approached me about doing this, I was a little hesitant, you know, because in my current work in the field of racial justice has, has made me kind of think, rethink my, my attitude towards fair housing. Uh, and in and its conventional form. And in some ways, uh, I, I fear our use and expectations of fair housing impede and, and perhaps thwart the essential work for the end of racial justice. <clears throat> Let's stipulate that uh, American society ha has been and remains racially segregated and segregation is a direct result of formal as well as informal processes. Uh, we can also stipulate that our segregated uh, communities are unequal. And while we know that poverty is uh, an American disgrace across the board, uh, we also know that black communities are particularly characterized by concentrated poverty. We know further that suburban communities, uh, though becoming more economically diverse, are generally wider and more affluent. Most of our thinking about civil rights flows from the unanimous Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision, largely the result of the brilliance of Charles Hamilton Houston, the man who killed Jim Crow, and, and those he trained. The decision struck down the underlying principle uh, of Jim Crow uh, as separate but equal. We honor and celebrate that decision as a watershed moment and have interpreted it, legal interpreted it as a legal mandate uh, to integrate our society. But as Bobby Scott lamented on the 65th anniversary of Brown, the money uh, flows follows whiteness. The unstated but proven fact is that separate cannot be equal in these United States of America because of racism. What Brown proved beyond any doubt is that in the United States, racism and white supremacy are the brick and mortar of our foundation. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm cobbling this together, okay. Okay, for clarity, when I say racism, I'm not speaking of any individual beliefs or attitudes or, or, or traits. I'm speaking of a structure in which membership and participation, the, the touchstones of citizenship, as well as access to uh, political, social, economic, environmental, health, and educational opportunity are distributed by race. Last night, I was part of a discussion uh, with a lawyer seeking reparations for the victims of descendants of Tulsa massacre almost 100 years ago. It's amazing to me how every few years we have to remember some horror in our racial history. I direct anyone who doubts my interpretation of Brown to study the destruction and demise of Black Wall Street at the hands of a white mob sanctioned by state authority. The Greenwood neighborhood was more than equal. It was superior and that would not have been, was not to be tolerated. Hundreds died trying to defend that, that what had been built 
homes were destroyed, the lives of survivors were ruined, property was seized. The remnants of Greenwood today are barely recognizable and black residents of Tulsa suffered from the same problems that haunt black communities across the country. I know we're here today to talk about fair housing, which as Lyndon Johnson said when he signed the Fair Housing Act in 1968, was the law of the land. Excuse me, but I wanna talk about another much less publicized 1968 document commissioned by President Johnson, the Kerner Commission on Civil Disorder, Kerner Commission Report on Civil Disorders. Published more than 50 years ago, this report took a comprehensive look at the conditions that led to the explosions known as uprising in American cities in the late 60s. The commission was deeply committed to preventing us from becoming, to my mind, continuing to be two societies, one black and one white. Although the commission covered several aspects of American life, we're concerned with what they thought about housing. They recognized we were already headed in two directions. The creation of affluent white suburbs and impoverished black inner cities called, that they called ghettos. The report identified three pathways forward. The first was to stay the course in which black urban centers and their suburban neighbors followed separate developmental trajectories. This meant more urban renewal for cities and highway and other fundamental enhancements for suburbs. Such a strategy would effectively accept the inevitability of and have us continue down the path toward two separate societies, one black and deprived, one white and privileged. The second choice would be to enrich the cities and abandon the goal of integration. And this choice, the report warned, in a country, this is a quote, in a country where the economy and particularly the resources of employment are predominantly white, a policy of separation can only relegate Negroes to a permanently inferior status, economic status. The authors clearly understood the depth of racism as a defining feature of our society and the true meaning of Brown. The third and for the commission preferable option would be to encourage, <coughs> excuse me, movement out of cities as they are enriched. The commission, whoops, all right, no, it's okay. Let me try to go back. I can't go back. I'm not, I'm not good at this. So yeah, here we go. Sorry. Uh, the, the, the commission saw this as an interim strategy at best and would only be, <coughs> excuse me, and could only be through substantial movement from city to suburb that we could achieve, quote, a single society in which every citizen will be free to live and work according to his capabilities and desires, not his color. Integration was the ultimate goal. This debate has been raging for decades in fair housing circles. The Obama administration sought to address this question with its both and strategy, encouraging us to confront the pressing needs of our cities, even as we encourage movement into the suburbs. For this recognition, as well as the regulations requiring firmly further in fair housing, it is to be commended. It is my firm belief, however, that we must continue the efforts to ensure that every vestige of racial or other form of discrimination be eliminated. I do not see the two sides of the equation as equal. I am an outlier in this. Take, for instance, the comment, <coughs> excuse me, by the left-leaning inclusive Haas, uh, Haas, Haas Institute in Berkeley, from which if, to look back, and in, during its look back at the Kerner Commission report. Now, this is just wrong and offensive in many fronts. I challenge anyone to demonstrate to me the vast resource, government resources that have been put to revitalizing urban cities, unless one thinks of policing as a form of revitalization. I would argue strenuously that we have failed to address the disparities and social determinants of health that have resulted from segregation and that this failure has been mindful and knowing. If we are willing to understand fair housing as the right <laughs> to live in a thriving, prosperous, healthy community, then we cannot rely on the flow of a few into suburban communities. As the Kerner Commission said decades ago, we must devote those resources to our cities. The most recent, the recent notion of opportunity zones, moving, uh, moving to opportunity in 21st century garb, betrays an incredible lack of understanding of racism and its effects. The very notion that in order to achieve your fair housing rights, you must move to white communities is racist. That is, it sustains and maintains a society in which all the benef those benefits I mentioned earlier are available only to whites. We must understand that opportunity is a condition, not a geography, that proximity does not translate into equality, and that we must redistribute opportunity rather than people. Last year, the Boston Globe 
<clears throat> which is a broad purveyor uh, <laughs> of this moving to opportunity model, published articles challenging and chastising suburban communities sprouting Black, Ladder, Black Lives Matter signs on their lawns. I would suggest to you that their solution is totally wrong, that if you choose to identify yourself as woke, uh, as standing in solidarity with Black Americans, you must act in support of policies and more important funding to address the pressing needs of Black residents of the segregated city cities that developed alongside the suburbs. We must forcefully reject the notion and accompanying practice of opening the door for a few more housing units or school seats in the suburbs as a form of racial justice. As I said earlier, Doing so is a knowing and blissful form of racism. If we are to advance the goal of racial justice, we must recognize that the door sits in a wall, that the wall is a structure of racism. Don't get me wrong, we need to open as many doors as we can along this wall, which often excludes other protected classes as well. But if we are to achieve racial and other forms of justice, that wall must come down. Those of us fortunate enough to get through must return to the wall and align our efforts with those on the other side to weaken it. Integration is not a pathway to racial justice, but can only result from such. Thank you. Thank you, David. And you bring up some great points about having to do more outside of uh, fair housing as well and connecting these parts uh, to some of our efforts as well. So Tracy, I know that you work on the federal level uh, on a lot of these things in terms of environmental racism. Uh, can you explain uh, how you've uh, worked to expand fair housing efforts to combat environmental racism and how you brought the DOJ, DOJ into the fair housing arena? Yes, uh, thank you everyone for having me. I'm very happy that Chapel extended me this invitation this afternoon. Um, what we are doing at NCRC is we have filed a case um, Right now it's sitting at HUD with about a chemical spill in a little town called Eight Mile, Alabama, which is about eight miles more th north of Mobile, Alabama, which is how it's got its name. Um, the community there is primarily rural, African-American, and um, has been that way for about, I would say, nearly 100 years. But the gas company moved into that area and set up a site to run their gas wells from. What happened was back in 2008, the gas company put mercaptan, which is all gas companies do. Mercaptan is that chemical that you smell when methane leaks. So that's how you know a methane leak has occurred because you smell the mercaptan. They had a spill of mercaptan. They lost 6,000 tons of it um, in that year and did not inform the community until the community started noticing the smell never went away. And that was, in 2010 when the community figured out that they had been poisoned in a sense with this mercaptan spill. They started trying to file a case. They filed a case in state court. Unfortunately, it settled, but most of the community was not asked. They only involved the homeowners. So when we were approached by the community and our partner at the South Alabama Center for Fair Housing to get involved, we didn't intake. We have ended up with 600 clients and we have brought their case before HUD because Unfortunately, the statutes at EPA had already um, been passed by the time we were brought involved. And the same thing had happened in the state court. So by we looked at it and realized we could argue this was a fair housing issue. These people are residents. This is their primary housing. This is where they live. They don't have the money to move anywhere else. They are stuck dealing with this smell. So we used the clause in the Fair Housing Act of it's an ongoing and continuing violation. The great thing about the Fair Housing Act, for those of you who don't know it well, is it is one of the broadest laws that has ever been passed in this country. That clause of an ongoing continuing violation means you can bring something 30 years later if the violation is still occurring and ongoing. So it doesn't matter exactly when it happened. Is the problem still happening? If the answer is yes, you can bring it to HUD. And you can also bring it in federal court and file a case on it we decided to try to go the HUD route of doing this. So we are asking HUD to look at it right now as a disparate impact issue with the idea that while we may not be able to show a direct different treatment of the communities um, 
in terms of what they got from the gas company. We tried that tactic first because the same gas parent gas company, which was Sempra Energy, owned the Mobile Gas Company, which is what spilled in Eight Mile. They had a similar spill out in Porter Ranch, California, which was an affluent white community. They spent $50 million cleaning up the issue in Porter Ranch, citing that they were forced to by the state of California and the Los Angeles County Health Department, but arguing they didn't need to do the same thing in Eight Mile because it wasn't exactly the same spill. And the state of Alabama nor the Mobile County Health Department pressed them to do anything, even though both the Alabama Department of Environmental Management was monitoring it and the health department was as well because they didn't feel the push, they didn't have to do it, they would work to remediate it, but they have offered very little help to the residents of the area. So they instead what they did was sold the company to Spire Energy and Spire ended up settling the lawsuit that had been filed and is working on remediating it. But the residents still suffer. It is now thir nearly 13 years to the time they said the lightning strike hit that tank and the residents still smell it. They suffer from cancer, asthma, migraines, rashes um, in that area. And it's interesting that when we've gone down, um, as people working for NCRC or the South Alabama Center for Fair Housing and spend a couple of days doing intakes and talking to residents, we all end up with headaches. So it's clear the issue is still there. And so what we have done is gone to HUD and said, we would like to use the disparate impact rule saying these people have been affected by a policy of, while the policy is, we're gonna follow exactly what we're being asked for by the state and no more, that that's not enough and it's a disparate impact effect on the health of the residents of Eight Mile, Alabama. We've also been talking and trying to talk to DOJ about this to get their um, environmental resources looking at and trying to see if they can look and see the same issue and also arguing on the same thing that it's a fair housing issue. Environmental racism is um, the idea that people that chemical companies tend to put themselves in communities of color because the land is cheaper and there may be more open access and less of an issue um, with zoning to get into the area causes the, particularly in the South, we have seen it, many communities of color have either a landfill, gas and chemical companies, paper companies located in communities of mm. color and the chemicals that come out into the air or spilled into the ground. The thing with the mercaptan is it's also in the groundwater in that area. Um, really affects the health of those residents and they are minorities and it is definitely a different treatment and a disparate impact on them. So we are with a new administration at HUD, we are waiting to hear what they're looking at with the disparate impact that we filed, but that's what we're doing at NCRC. And we're starting to look at other areas too, to see how we can use disparate impact under the Fair Housing Act to make a difference in environmental racism, um, for, particularly for areas where lawsuits are long past for people to be able to fight for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And I really appreciate you and your team as well for using the broadness of the Fair Housing Act to really fight against some of this environmental racism, because uh, we know it's all connected and where you live really determines your, you know, your social determinants of health and everything like that. Before I let you go, uh, um, as we look kind of forward, what do you think the role is of the national government and its agencies kind of moving forward in either strengthening fair housing protections or making sure that those fair housing protections are actually enforced? I think they're going to move towards it. We, I mean, the spin that has occurred to me in HUD uh, since Secretary Fudge uh, was confirmed and put in, like I said, moving the disparate impact rule from what was under the previous administration back to the 2013 rule where you force businesses to show they had a necessary business necessity for a, to make a policy that affects people of color, which they didn't under the previous administration, but we take it back to that and makes it better so people can make those arguments. Seeing HUD trying to work on really improving the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule and make it stronger. And now seeing that EPA is starting to open up more and starting to look at issues says to me that 
this is our time to make some pushes on the federal government to do the right thing. Also, one of the things we're trying to work on is adding in um, policies into not just regulations, but into the actual acts. Um, we are working on CRA to include race as a provision in CRA to be measured, not just low income, race as well, because that's the whole idea is right now is the time we feel like to strike and we're working with our members to make some really positive changes in the law while we have an administration that's friendly to it. Thank you for that, Tracy. And we appreciate that we have an ally on the national level that will kind of hold this administration accountable and will make those pushes. So really appreciate that. Uh, so moving on now to Dwayne. Uh, I know that here in Massachusetts, we also like to make sure that we're pushing our administration here to strengthen fair housing as well. And your work at ACE, uh, you're making sure that your organizing efforts have focused on educating residents about their legal fair housing rights and making sure that we're empowering people in their own communities uh, to understand their rights as well as to fight for those rights as well. Uh, so can you explain a little bit about how AFFH looks kind of on the ground level and what we can do as a local and as a community uh, to ensure that people have those protections? Um, to have protections and know and to know that you have those protections are two different things. And that's always been the issues with fair housing. Many people that are most impacted by housing discrimination do not know they baseline fair housing um, protections. They don't understand the fair housing laws and regulations. So if it's still a gap between the fair housing fundamentals, a firmly furthering fair housing is Latin mixed with Arabic and Hebrew to the people on the ground that are most impacted. All across the country during the other side of the real estate boom, our communities was being displaced economically across the region, outside of their neighborhoods, into the suburbs and exurbs. And it was more than likely enough regulations on the books to have a different type of regulatory and legal arguments to prevent this from happening. But people on the ground, people on a policy level, did not know enough about fair housing to use it as a tool to make it functional to the people. So the struggle is still education. A firmly furthering fair, hou fair housing, assessment for fair housing on um, documents, fair housing in general does not work until we create a certain tipping point in the communities that they know they are being discriminated against. And once they know they're being discriminated against, where do they go to get some type of remedies? And right now in the city of Boston, it's, it's, it's almost non-existent to like real people. Some, the minority knows, but the vast majority of people, when they get discriminated against, they move on to the next possibility. They don't have time and the resources to focus on the discrimination. So we as a society have a lot of work to do in the very near future if these regulations gonna actually become a real tool to protect our protected classes. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, and so I'm gonna kick it back to you with the same kind of question that I asked for Tracy. So what do you think moving forward that we can do on the state level or even in the city level uh, to make sure that we're upholding those fair housing protections? And what do you forecast those either being strengthened kind of moving forward? Money resources, a budget line, money, more money, meaning that this education is not gonna happen organically. It's not gonna be piecemeal by multiple different organizations who will talk the language of fair housing. It needs to be like when you turn on the radio, you should hear fair housing and where you could go if you are discriminated against. When you turn on TV, it should be on Twitter, it should be everywhere. And it's still an absence of this. It's still a little club of, of, of the wonks that 
are still playing with this concept and they haven't really had kind of like mass media exposure. So the things that we need to push on the local state and federal level is put a real dedicated investment in education and then combine, coordinate the education with enforcement. Because without the enforcement piece, you could go on Craigslist right now and you could find um, fair housing violations in like 30 ads, <laughs> little no enforcement. So this is where we are. We have laws that are enforceable, but we don't have the means to enforce. We have laws that if people are educated, they could stand on those laws and be protected, but the vast majority of the people who need it the most do not know. So thank you. Thank you for that, Dwayne. And I think that, you know, we saw over the past year that uh, when we faced a pandemic that we've seen billions of dollars, trillions of dollars getting put in uh, to emergency rental assistance and other kind of housing resources. So uh, we need to be able to fight going into our recovery to make sure that there's resources for education and fair housing as well. Yeah. So, so I will say this, the system will always respond with resources when the system is, um, is compromised, hmm. right? They will give tons of money, but to create the change that the vision of civil rights and fair housing, fair lending, environmental justice, the resources, we have to fight every nickel and dime to get those resources for education and enforcement. And right now, um, we are really, really behind. And the last thing I'm gonna say that our community, my people have been displaced out of Boston for the past decade. This is not, this, this is not, Boston Metro is still segregated. If you live in Boston, you don't have a diverse community. <laughs> you live in that area you are slotted in still to this day. In the exceptions, and you don't need a, a, a study to kind of prove it. You could just drive. You know Brookline is Brookline and Newton is Newton, but you know where Roxbury is. You know where Dorchester is. You know where Brockton is. We are still slotted based on a very segregated housing pattern that affect the economics, the social, political realities of our communities and society as a whole. And, and the energy that needs to change it is not there right now. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists here today to really expand this conversation of fair housing. Uh, it's not just one thing. Uh, it, it touches environment, it touches schools, it touches economics, as Duane has said. And thank you just all for your work and making sure that we bring that into this conversation.